The key point I want to make is that the way we see diode mixer technology as it stands today is that the T3 mixer that we have is the dominant linearity mixer up to 10 to 20 gigahertz. And then beyond that, the dominant topology for diode mixers is going to be microlithics and or mimic, mimic mixers. Uh, both have pros and cons, and I'll show you now. So the microlithic is a patented technology. Um, the patent was actually officially um, granted in December. And uh, you can read all about it if you really want to bore yourself. But um, it's not that much different from Mimics, but there are a couple key feature differences. First of all, th both technologies involve multi-layer stack ups. So we have some kind of substrate. In the case of a Mimic, the diodes are built into the substrate or the FETs or whatever it might be. The uh, metallization has multi-layer and it's separated by some kind of dielectric. The microlithic is really no different. I would say the main difference is that in a microlithic, I have free will to change the thicknesses and the metals and the materials. So if you go to TriQuint, for example, or Wind Semiconductor or UMS, they're going to give you a PDK, and good luck getting them to change anything about that. You're a little guy, Marky. There's no way, like, unless you're running 1,000 wafers a month, I don't think they even care. And so you're left with whatever it is. And so the geometries may or may not be ideal for balance, balance structures. Since I'm talking about specifically mixers with on-chip balance, this makes a huge difference. If I'm making off-chip balance, you know, you can do what you want. But in the case of the microlithic, I can actually tailor the thickness of the dielectric, the thickness of the metal, the number of layers that I can, that I can uh, use. In principle, the mi microlithic can be six metal layers thick, but it turns out that if you know what you're doing, you don't actually need that. And then the other important feature is that the microlithic allows you to do what we call a package on chip. So the actual circuit that I make the balance and then I attach the diode to that, to that substrate is also the package. So when I make a surface mount product, I, I just you know, uh, design into the edge of the substrate a surface mount transition, which is a plated via, or actually a filled via, I'm sorry. And that, depending on the thickness of the substrate, could take me easily beyond 30 gigahertz surface mount. In fact, there's no reason we couldn't go to 40 or 50, except for the fact that I don't think the, that many people need that quite yet. The Mimic is slightly different, of course. Because everything's on chip, I don't need discrete diodes. Uh, that's a really nice feature, so I don't have a lot of parasitics inter interconnecting the, di the balance with the, the devices. However, you always have to package that di die into something else. Uh, if you're selling a surface mount product, that usually goes into like a QFN package. That interconnection between the die and the QFN package is not nearly as good as the kind of transitions that we can get in the microlithic. So that's another drawback of, of Mimics. Nevertheless, they're both extremely powerful fabrication technologies, and uh, they're both going to be used by Marking Microwave well, well into the future. So here's a microlithic mixer. It's a double balanced mixer, identical in topology to the hybrids that I was showing you later, or sorry, <laughs> the hybrids I was showing you earlier. We can get the, the broadest band microlithic I've been able to make so far is about 2 to 20 gigahertz with a DC to 3.5 gigahertz IF. So we can get up to about 10 to 1 bandwidth, depending on how good we are at making the balance. Um, the limitation is really, I think, uh, how broad you can make a capacitively coupled balance. We do not have integrated magnetics, so I can't take these mixers below about a gigahertz. And that's also true of, of double balanced mimic mixers. You can see that we achieved about a 14x size reduction. And the end product is about 90 mil by 152 mil, which is I virtually identical in area to a 3 millimeter QFN. In fact, it's slightly smaller, just so I could say it was smaller. The way we design microlithics and mimics is basically identical. And um, it's definitely different from the way that my dad designed the T3. Um, it's all done on the computer. It's all done with microwave office and HFSS. What we do is we fully 3D simulate the entire mixer passive structure. We 
output that S parameter file into Microwave Office, hook up our diode models, and by the way, the diode models are key. You have to know what your diodes are doing if you want this to be accurate, and uh, we do. We simulate it in the harmonic balance tool, and we iterate in this layer. We don't actually tape out until we're happy. When we tape out, it can take anywhere, you know, typical fabrication, anywhere from, call it five weeks if you're lucky, to 10 weeks if you're lucky, and uh, potentially six months if you're really unlucky and they screw up. But uh, that's only happened like once. The uh, end result uh, gets back in our lab. It's almost finished. In the case of a microlithic, we still have to do diode assembly. And uh, in the case of a mimic, we have to do chip assembly. So, you know, they're, they're complementary sets of skills, but they're not identical. And this design flow, at this point for us, is first pass every time. And the reason is that we understand what the nuances of the, the simulations are, and we also have been able to compare so many, so many designs against the simulations. And we, we've closed that loop probably 40 or 50 times at this point. The most novel feature, in my opinion, about what we're doing is not this. This is not like magic. Everybody's like, oh yeah, I know, this is how you make ICs. Like, thanks for telling me this. The, the important thing that I'm showing you is that because our simulations agree with our measurements, I can now give you my simulation files. And this is, as far as I know, uh, the first time that a mixer vendor in the industry actually did this. So how good are the simulations? Well, they're really good, and they agree very well with the good measurements. You can see a conversion loss, return loss, isolation, all very good. In this case, we have a microlithic mixer, about 1 to 13 gigahertz. Here's a 2 to 20 gigahertz mixer. Again, we have really, really nice overlap. And this is because we uh, ha know how to run the simulations very well. And, and I would say, as a general point, uh, this could not be done in a 2D or a 2.5D simulation. In my opinion, you have to use the full 3D model because of the, the nuances of, of the, the parasitics. Uh, I've seen people try to run these simulations on 2.5D, and I'm always left wanting. So the linear specs are great. Uh, Isolation is very good, conversion loss, return loss. I should point out that the isolation doesn't match perfectly, especially as you get to lower and lower uh, isolation values. Once you get below 30, 35, 40 dB, the instability and accuracies of the, of the numerics start to become a little bit problematic. Um, the fabrication, if it's off by a few percent, 10 percent maybe on a line width, it could change the, the IF return to ground and change the overall balance of the ballon. And so generally, once it's accurate to about 30 dB, if it's not exactly right at 40, there's really nothing I can do. And in fact, that's basically in the noise of the fabrication anyway. What about uh, nonlinearity? The harmonic balance is surprisingly good. Um, this is just a simple CW up conversion where we were looking at all the spurs. And, and this is over about a 80 or 100 dBc dynamic range. And you can see that of all these spurs, they're all pretty close. Some of, them aren't, some of them are better than others, and I'll be honest, we are at the beginning of a very long quest to understand which ones are better and why. But uh, overall, 3 or 4 dB agreement, I'll take that over this kind of dynamic range, especially when the alternative is for my customer to manually enter a spur table into his simulation. In this case, it's a black box model. It's just a three-port device. I make no requirement that you surround the mixer with 50 ohm loads. You can put filters. You can reactively terminate. You could actually, in principle, do things like image recovery and, and some, some exotic um, reactive impedance loading on the mixer. I make no claims that you'll be successful at it, but in principle, it could be done. Comparisons between the microlithic and the mimic, just to give you a little bit of a performance um, understanding. Like I said, microlithics probably are best suited between 1 and 50 gig. Mimics can go, I don't think they are, go as well um, down in frequency as the microlithic primarily because of the metal thicknesses. Um, so I, I would say maybe at 4 gigahertz they're really good and then they can go up to terahertz. These diodes are really, really nice. 
the ohmic loss of the metal in a microloop that can be lower because I can tailor it to whatever thickness I really want. Um, development cost is a huge factor in microlithic versus mimic. It's a fraction of the cost because we're constantly running masks on the microlithic and the mask sets are much cheaper than your typical gallium arsenide run. So when you do a mimic, you have to have a really good justification for what you're doing and you pray that you didn't get it wrong so you have to double your, your expenditure. In high volume, mimics will always be cheaper than microlithics. So if you, if you had to think about the actual production costs, it always is going to go hybrid mixer, microlithic, mimic underneath that. And I think because of the various attributes, there will be a place for all of these um, technologies in, in different application spaces. Um, space qualification is an interesting one. It's actually easier to qualify a mimic mixer versus a microlithic mixer. We've already looked into it. and. Um, I think the Mimic is probably the way to go if people wanted to do it. Uh, although, frankly, I'm not um, eagerly trying to chase that business because it's a lot of work. But hey, call us. Um, surface mount. The microlithic is, is syst or package on chip. QFN is package in, or chip in package. And that's a major difference, um, especially when it comes to um, the creativity and flexibility of what you can design. And uh, I guess in the long run, um, we don't quite know which one's going to win. Are they going to compete with each other and eat each other? Or are they going to live symbiotically? I, I think it'll be a little bit of both. And uh, we look forward to developing many more of these in the coming years.